Okay, so I'm Mike Kuhner, and I'll talk to you about something that will be familiar to, uh, well, at least a problem that will be familiar to most of you guys, I think. Okay, so you're going to have to permit me just a little bit of Unix nerd humor here. All right, so if you look into any big Unix nerd's home directory and do something like ls-start.rc, you see, like, basically it's like a badge of honor. Like, if you don't have 12 of these suckers in there, you are not cool. And, it, and, it, and you look in one of these RC files, and each line is like some sort, has some sort of history to it. Like the day they were supposed to be working on the project, but instead they sent eight hours customizing the perfect Zish prompt. <laughs> you know, you know each, or this one they got from this guy. He was an Australian. It was at a conference. Right. That, so hopefully I'll get a chance to trade some crap with you guys later on today. But, but you know what, what all these things are. So nerds, you may notice from observation or perhaps realistic introspection, um, love to customize their junk. Like, you need everything tricked out, shined up, a beautiful buff. I, mean, I love this picture. Like, look, look how... Look how much work has gone into this thing. Like, I can't imagine. All I know, the only word I know that describes what people do in this process is buffing. Like, but there's like 17 other things that involves getting your wheel that shiny, I'm sure, and chemicals, and, right. I don't know anything about it, but I can tell you that this sort of customization, classic customization, is a big nerd thing. But it's a thing that lately I felt was sort of fraught with peril. Because after a while, you, you shine up the wheels, and you sort of get the little dial up front going and everything. And then it's like, man, there just doesn't seem to be all that much left to customize. I mean, yes, I just got three spams in, and that probably means I need to add a few lines to procmail.rc. <laughs> and, and, you know, I bet there's just one or two Vim plugins that would really revolutionize my life. But... But it's hard to imagine exactly what they do exactly. <laughs> or if you're an Emacs guy, you've already reached the point where you never leave Emacs for any reason. <laughs> like, you've got a command to use the toilet. You've got a command. Uh, <laughs> right? Everything starts feeling pretty good and pretty normal. And, and, and then you're like, man, you know, I, I feel like I'm done here. Like, my computer rocks pretty hard. <laughs> and then... But then the question is, well, what do you do now? I mean, there's these people who keep hanging out at your house. Apparently, you're related to them. Maybe you could consider talking to them. Apparently, religion is good. Ruby is probably know about that a little bit. But, uh, you know, you could get into that more. Racquetball. Or you could say, screw all that. What I'm going to do is get, I'm going to tape something that essentially works and needlessly add a fishbowl to it. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so my opinion is you're not done, because what you don't realize is that all your awesome customizations have been essentially happening between the screen and your computer, and not in the external physical world, where you could be adding more bizarre stuff. And in general, at least with me, not shiny, pure, perfect stuff, but more or less ugly, weird stuff that everyone's going to be like, what's that sort of tumor hanging off your computer? <laughs> and you'll be like, well, I sort of built this USB thing. And anyways, if you twiddle it around, you switch between desktops or something. And I thought it would be cool. <laughs> right. So that's the idea. Like, this is not about USB for, like, really hardcore hardware people who are like, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm building this thing that normal people actually want. This is USB for, for hackers who want to be able to take, like, this mouse they have in their closet, sort of put it in there, and then make it do something, like, I don't know, play like cucaracha when they jiggle it around or what have you, right? Like, fun stuff. Like, this was not a project for work for me. And no one would pay me to do this sort of thing. This is for fun stuff. All right, so the idea is you get, you get USB devices and you control them using Ruby. I mean, Bluetooth would be even cooler, but I didn't have time to look into that one. 
So USB devices, Ruby. And why USB devices? Well, main reason is if, you're, if your primary source of hardware is the Best Buy bargain bin, and for me it is, you're going to pretty much want something that is cheap and available. And also, USB devices are self-describing. So you notice when you plug in that mouse that you got from the Best Buy bargain bin, it's very pleasing to see that your Windows is like, hey, Japanese character, Japanese character, Japanese character, mouse has been found. <laughs> and you're like, good, I think, I think it's going to happen for me. <laughs> right? So obviously there's something in there that's letting the, the device know what it is. And I mean, those of you who remember back to the days before all this stuff, when you would plug in the serial mouse, then you would try to find the driver for it, and then you would, you would plug it in, it wouldn't work properly, you would reinstall everything, still wouldn't work properly, right. So that's done now, you don't have to do that. USB devices can tell you a lot about what they are. And even more so, human interface device USB devices. Like, your USB printer can say it's a printer, and your USB little thumb drive thing can say it's a thumb drive, and actually act like a thumb drive. But USB human interface devices actually can talk a lot about being very weird, basically, very non-standard, and still basically work. Okay, and the third thing, which, because it's not really having anything to do with Ruby, you know, I, I, I feel hesitant to talk about it too much, but you can actually build your own USB devices. So I'm going to be sort of jamming that at the end. But it's not that hard. It's, it's, good, it's easy enough that a retarded monkey like me can do the soldering necessary. So it's pretty easy. Okay, so USB has a variety of different sub-specs. Like any good spec, there are sub-specs. Then that sub-spec actually has sub-specs. So the main USB spec says stuff like, okay, you've got the devices. They can plug into hubs. They can be powered or not. They can have what's called configurations, which if anyone has a USB device that actually uses configurations, I want you to call me because I've never found a device that actually uses this feature, and I've never tested this part of Ruby USB. Because configurations are like, you could have a totally, like your USB device can act different if it has external power versus internal power from your computer. And then you can have different modes and you could switch between them, like go to this mode, go to this mode. Does anyone have a USB device like that? Anyways, it's in the spec. And so you got that. And then the final thing you have is basically these interfaces, which are what you normally think of as the actual thing it does. Only you could have more of those, too. You, one configuration could have like three different interfaces. So you've got your USB device, thumb drive slash salad shooter. Those could both be separate interfaces on the same device. Um, and, and one of them conforms to the shallot, salad shooter spec, and one of them conforms to the drive spec. So there's multiple different USB specs for different kinds of devices, but the most interesting one is the HID human interface device spec because it's so flexible. So you can, I have, if you go to rubyusb.technofetish.net, you will find my website, and on there there's a thing that's all the links for this presentation. So you don't have to type in that endless pile of crap if you want to actually look up this document. It's all there. All the, all the stuff that I reference is there. So, human interface devices. The goal here, I don't know what they were thinking in the spec deciding meeting, but I think basic, I mean, basically the way this thing works is you've got this human interface device and it's sending data in whatever crazy format it wants, but it, before it sends that, it gives you a description of the data it's going to send. You would think, you know, any device could actually benefit from that particularly neato feature. But for some reason, it, it's in the human interface spec that you can specify all sorts of details about the format in which the data is going to be sent. And for me, that's humongous, because that means that when you plug your, your interface, your device in, and then you try to talk to it with Ruby, Ruby's like, hey, I'm just going to look at this little document, okay? Yes, here's the seven different numbers this device just sent me. Here's the stuff it said about what those seven different numbers mean. Here's the annotation someone did on those seven different numbers. So yeah, so let's give an example. Okay, so here we have what you would look at in the old days when you were trying to reverse engineer some piece of crap you found somewhere. You got some string of bits and you're like, hmm, I don't know, those zeros seem like nothing's happening. Which thing am I not pressing right now? 
right? And then the, the ones, you're like, huh. Right, okay. And then you look at the actual thing that's happening, and it's nothing like what you're actually thinking, right? Because, okay, so, so we're going to go from left to right and the features that the, the USB spec has. So the, on the far left is the left mouse button. This is the most useful one. This is the thing that lets that Taiwanese device I was talking about sort of work. Because USB, has a, the HID devices have a spec where it's like, I have this magic number, and that means it's the left mouse button that you know about, that you want to use for that icon clicking I do. So, so, and then if you go into the really more obscure section of the spec, you've got stuff you don't think you need, like, this is a chaff release button. So for all your joysticks that have chaff release buttons, they can all interoperate as long as they conform to the spec that they use the chaff button release code. It's, I'm not kidding about this. This is in there. Okay. And then you can start saying things that, as far as I can tell, no one ever really uses because there's no actual program or interface that I can find anywhere that utilizes this. But you can say things like, these numbers are logically grouped together. And I'm going to annotate it with this string that describes stuff about it. And I have no idea where you would see this unless you were, like, maybe Microsoft has, like, a secret tool that lets you get this information. And be, but, but as far as I can tell, it's completely inaccessible. There's no way to actually see these annotations that the developers might have implicitly put in their hardware for your benefit. And then there's nothing. I really like nothing. Because if you're reverse engineering some crazy device, and you see this thing, and it's like, it always seems to be zero. I wonder what that means. You're al you always, in the back of your mind, are thinking, is there like, like if this thing was immersed in water or something, would it put the water immersion code in there? You know, like what, this, this, these zeros, do they ever, or like, you know, something important that I should notify my users about? You never quite know if it's really nothing, or you just haven't triggered the right thing to be nothing to be, make nothing something. But in USB, you can actually say, yeah, yeah these bits are just for byte alignment. The the Ruby so the, no, no, I, with Ruby USB, you almost can. I haven't actually added that feature, but it's pretty close. So yeah, but, but outside of that, like, like, I don't know why they had this in the spec considering it was not possible to see them because no one had written any tools to see it before that, as far as I could tell. And then you can say really weird stuff like, What's, what's the unit that this thing is coming back with? And what's the exponent on the unit this thing is coming back with? And what's the minimum value, the maximum value? There's actually two different kinds of those, and I forget what the difference is. Um, the other nice thing I like to say is, yeah, negative numbers, right? How long would it take you to figure that one out during the reverse engineering thing? That this is like the two's complement of what you're, yeah. That wouldn't have been easy. See, good that we have a spec for this sort of stuff. Okay, so how do you do this? This is the beginning of the lang like of a piece of a mouse's descriptor. So you can see over there on the right that it's basically a hexadecimal code. And then you set a variety of different things about it. I'm going to talk about a few of them that actually matter if you ever want to hack on USB devices. So the usages, see that usage page, usage, right. Those are about... Basically, those are the things I was telling you about where you can specify the code that indicates what kind of thing that people might really be looking for. You can, uh, so like left mouse button is a particular usage page and usage. Or the keyboard queue is another usage page and usage. The usage page is like the more general thing, and then the usage is a more particular thing. The, for some reason, the spec rather than specifying, res rather than risking repeating themselves, has this very complicated set of rules about what things are global, when and what in what circumstance. One of the main features of Ruby USB is that it figures all that crap out for you. But to give you a brief description, the usage page actually gets appended to the usage. So when you ask for a usage in Ruby USB, you're actually getting both the usage page and the usage itself which are two things, or they could be specified as one thing. <laughs> okay. And then you've got those collections. I was telling you about those collections before where you group things together for some reason. Right, you can do that. And, but, and then over there is there's the, the logical minimum, logical maximum. Those are the ranges I was telling you about, which is sort of nice to be able to specify how stuff ranges. 
and then the report count indicates how many things your how many basically blocks in your report binary string are going to be devoted to each item and then the report size says how long each of those blocks is going to be and then you say input and then it makes it basically implicitly means okay that report size and report count that i previously specified somewhere in the giant stack of input things that i could have previously specified now use whatever values you currently have for that in this context and add that to this report's sort of list of implicit members if this seems complicated to you the good news is ruby usb just figures all that crap out for you so you can stop listening okay but that's why i've highlighted the inputs in that they're the key things they're like okay do this stuff i've been talking about forever up to this moment right so that's that's the highlighted yeah so you can see three one bit buttons and then one five bit empty space it's empty cuz that see that cnst next to the green input that means constant so i suppose theoretically it could actually be used to send a constant value to the user's computer like if you wanted to send the user pi or the first couple bits of pi you could jam that in there be like here's a constant for your convenience <laughs> i don't know in the spec okay so enough about in, in slides things okay now i have a i have a, a, a uh, confession to make as much as of a unix guy as i am i i didn't want to risk trying to hook my unix laptop up to the projector thing and figuring out whether it could output the right resolution correctly so <laughs> and this only works in unix like operating systems unfortunately and there's no windows version of ruby usb so i have actual text files of my irb sessions from last night so these things really 100% exist like real code just you know yesterday <laughs> okay so okay so this is a part i really want you guys to ask me questions about because this is the stuff you might actually theoretically be doing if you want to play around with ruby usb so i'm going to try to explain it in somewhat detail and i'm going to and i'm going to try to and if you if you don't know what i'm talking about i want you to shout at me you know throw things at me okay so one of the annoying things about ruby usb is it uses c++ and c libraries and so the load library path is rather complicated especially since you usually have to be sudo because under linux unless you do a lot of playing around your usb devices are owned by root right so see this little sudo ld irb thing here that's my little shorthand for doing all the necessary load library path stuff i need to do to make it happen which you're going to have to figure out too sorry okay then require lib usb see that's as easy as you'd want though now if 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 i hadn't done the sudo ld business that would return to false in some really inscrutable error though okay so usb colon colon devices each iterate over all usb devices in the system and print out some stuff about them and here they are here's all the usb devices that were currently connected to my computer when i did that i had an optical mouse a keyboard the usb hub for my keyboard i'm not sure what that one is these are all controllers that seem to think they're usb devices but don't do anything the touch panel and yeah more controllers so yeah so all these different usb devices which are usb device objects in my system and then i go ahead and grab one by using its vendor id and product id and there's nothing magical about the vendor id and product id that just goes to a ruby function that's like you know blah blah, blah select vendor for vendor id and product id it's just convenient for me because it uniquely identifies the device most of the time the vendor and product id and you get a device back and then you can say things like hey what's its name what's its manufacturer and is it a human interface device that's that hid question mark right now everyone following me so far okay do 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 so the main thing to realize when it says hid question mark in this context is it's asking in any of its configurations for any of its interfaces is this a hid device remember i was talking about that salad shooter combination usb drive right it can be more than one thing at once so you have to be sort of careful and that makes things more complicated than they maybe ought to be okay speaking more complicated so now i grab my optical mouse 
And you can see it's, Microsoft says it's a basic optical mouse. And then I say, OK, give me the first interface. Now, this is mostly for shortness, because what I really should say is iterate over all interfaces to find the hid interface that this thing actually implements. Except no one implements more than one interface for any reason. But they could, in theory. OK, yeah. So he's asking, is there any sort of class of devices that you can't get information from due to their performance characteristics and stuff like that? The answer is, at this level we're doing right now, not really because this is all more or less stuff it has to give up to the operating system or it ain't a USDV device. So, so at this point, there's no issues of synchronization for the most part. Although occasionally, if you get certain large chunks of data, it might time out in certain circumstances. But um, once you start actually trying to communicate with the device, you might have some problems. I don't know if you would, but I haven't had a problem with that so much. OK. Now here comes an annoying part, or maybe a good part, depending on what your use case is. Mouse interface dash de dot detach kernel. Before you can do most interesting things with a USB device, you need to detach it from the kernel. Otherwise, the kernel is going to keep trying to interpret it however it's going to interpret it. The bad news about this is once you do detach it from the kernel, there's no reattach to kernel command. <laughs> so for example, once I did this, my mouse stopped working. <laughs> I'll tab. You know, I handled it. But you can unplug your device and plug it back in. But as far as I can tell, that's the only thing you can do to get it reattached to the kernel. OK. So then I ask for my, my interface for this for all input usages that it has. The, so those usages I was telling you before were you know, the things that, like, what things does it support? And you can see a, quite a big list came back, although it would have been way longer if it was a keyboard, because um, it would have been like, I support A, I support B, I support C. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yes, you can see like it's got a wheel on there and all these different things. Like the first thing in the is the usage page, and then the second thing is the usage. So, are those no, no. Um, I have a little JSON file that has they're in the USB spec. Um, I actually have a little program, a, a thing in the USB framework where you can actually say, OK, listen for this usage once you get, once you get to that point. But we're not going to do that right here. What I do is I say, OK, listen for interrupts. So the one thing to keep in mind is before you start getting info from your USB device, you have to tell it to start listening. Right? It uses the Ruby block syntax where within the block, it's open and listening, and outside the block, it's not. And then you ask for the next interrupt, and it will give you a data object. And you can see over here the exciting binary string I got back from my mouse. And then if I say this, data.setUsages. Now that seems backwards because we're trying to get the usages. What it's saying is, what usages were set in this data that I just got back from this thing? So in a keyboard, you actually can have any number of letters that are possible usages, but only a few are set in any particular piece of data you get back from it. So it gives me, OK, it sent me back button 1 was on, button 2 was off, button 3 off, x coordinate was 0, y coordinate was 0, and wheel was 0. This is not as surprising as you might think, because uh, mice are relative devices, not absolute. And so all I did was press the left button, and so that was the only thing that was set in the datagram. If I, I could have given you a whole big line of crap in this demo if you wanted to, where you know, it was rolling all around and stuff, but I decided you would get the picture. OK. And now finally, for my third example, an actual program that uses Ruby USB. And here, I want to show you the device that, you, that it uses with. Let me just put this down for a sec. Hello? OK. I call this the world's most ghetto TV remote control. <laughs> I found it at a thrift store. On the back, it says Toshiba LED control module. I really have no idea what its purpose was at all. Like, I think it might be some sort of telephony thing. 
Anyways, this is what the thing uses. I reverse engineered the, the, the device's protocol in about an hour. And then the much more annoying process of figuring out how to communicate with VLC. So here we go. The, the stuff that's actually USB related in this code is down here. Get the device, right, right here. OK, find the right endpoint. Detach the kernel. And then here's that listen for hid interrupts I was telling you about before. And it gets the button codes and then starts doing stuff, basically. Okay. Meanwhile, so that was about, I don't know, 50, 30 lines, 50 lines, something like that. And then all this stuff is like communicating in sockets through VLC. Much more annoying. OK. So VLC is like a Linux uh, video player. So when I watch my anime, like all the buttons are all hooked up, and I adjust the volume and stuff. <coughs> yep, you can get it for Windows. And one of the nice things is it's a really Unix-y kind of program. So it has things like, oh, yeah, you want to send me commands over a socket? Well, of course I support that, because I'm a Unix-y kind of thing. <laughs> OK, back to the presentation here. OK, how does it work? Three layers. I won't spend too long on this. LibUSB. I did not write LibUSB. Somebody else did. I don't really know who, honestly. It's a cross-platform USB library that works, in theory, on all Unix-like operating systems, including Mac OS X. In particular, Windows is exempted. It's OK, but a little funky. In fact, one of the major takeaways from this project is normally when you think about interfacing with C in Ruby, you're like, OK, it's, it's C. It's all good, because you know, most of the time you're interfacing with some operating system level layer that's really rock solid and has been hammered on for like a million years. Yeah, Ruby, uh, LibUSB is not quite that solid. So as a result of that, you get really annoying behavior that you can't avoid because it's in this really low level layer that you just haven't written and, but yet Ruby people don't expect like random timeouts for no reason, you know? Um, so, it's supposedly cross-platform. I have never tried this on anything but a Linux box. I just don't have anything but a Linux box. Um, and yeah, it, it's important to realize you have to get the latest version from CBS or it doesn't work for some reason. And you already know about the kernel stuff. The way this thing works is it's a very C-like interface in that like, you, you ask it to look at a USB device and it starts filling up some C structs that, that basically constitute the data. And navigating through them is sort of a pain. You wish they had objects, but they don't. But still, it works pretty well. Next layer, my hid parser, yes? Is there any other way to talk to USB devices? Well, I mean, it talks to the same kernel libraries that you could, right? So yeah, in theory, I also have another project called EVDev for Ruby which I'll talk about just a little bit at the end. It's a little more rock solid, but less cool. OK, here's another one of my big mistakes when doing this project. Take heed. I wrote this thing in C++, because I thought, I don't know, maybe someone else will want a hit parser, and they'll want it in C++. Dumb idea. A humongous pain in the butt to do. I hate the standard template library. It's a huge annoyance. And the worst part is, though, because I'm basically making a rich object system in C++, I then have to convert that rich object system to Ruby. And it never is as rich as it needs to be to get me the data I discover I want later. And so then I've got to go back in, because none of the parsing is in there. So for example, doing things like, oh, what was the original set of binary hex characters that generated this particular segment? Oh, that's something I can't figure out very easily at all. Right, so this is the sort of stuff in my opinion, that was a big mistake. I had to do it all over again. I would write this in pure Ruby, connecting to uh, libUSB directly. OK. The goal of this thing is to basically return what are called report descriptor objects. They're like, hey, you're gonna, this thing can send three different kinds of reports. And the first one's going to be x-coordinate, y-coordinate, temperature. And the other one's going to be 
this thing. And the other one's going to, that's the format I want from, as a programming perspective, right? Not like this big stack-based thing, but something I can always query for the exact relevant information when I've got some data coming through. Other, other, I suppose the one really smart thing I did with this, unit tests. Never try to implement an extremely boring, humongous spec without unit tests. Always use unit tests. It cannot work without unit tests. You would you'd be amazed about the times I'd be like, oh, new feature finally implemented, and then like half the old features would be gone. Also, you know, you don't have an infinite number of USB devices at, at your disposal, so if you want to have something that has multiple configurations or something like that, you've got to sort of fake it out. And then my thing. Tries to do the right thing as much as possible. It has good documentation. It produces objects that are annotated with as much data as I currently collect about them. That's the idea. You get data back from the USB device and you can figure out what the heck the data is supposed to be. And then ignore that information and do what you want it to do, like control your desktops or what have you. But at least you know what it was thinking it was supposed to be for. Okay, so that's the big picture. LibUSB gives raw USB descriptions to the hid parser. Which, trucks to the report, which sends report descriptor objects to the USB library. And then you've got a complete descriptor that you can then ask for information from the USB device. At this point, the Ruby USB starts communicating directly to libUSB, right? It knows what the data is supposed to be looking like, so it basically starts sending data back and forth, and then your app gets these handy annotated objects that you can use for maximum easy uh, USB device manipulation. And then finally, if you really want to get crazy, oh yeah, custom built USB devices. I particularly like the idea of a custom USB chainsaw. I think that has real potential. <laughs> Anyone want to help me with that project? I am there. So, <laughs> AVR USB is what I use to build my USB devices. If you've got an AVR programmer, or you've got a hundred bucks you can spend on a project that's really cool, and basically a $5 little microprocessor, you can and a few other assorted parts that probably cost $2 or so altogether, you can make a working USB device. I mean working anywhere, like you can plug this sucker into Unix and it'll be like, yeah, it's a mouse, and I am totally believe in that. Um, <laughs> so it's really fun. I mean, it's not Ruby at all, but it is fun, and you can program it in C, which I mean, as Ruby guys, you know C because you have to write all your extensions in C, right? So it's not that bad. So yeah, check that out. It was one of the most fun things I did as part of this project. I wish I had my USB device, but one of the soldering things got sort of screwed up and it doesn't work. Okay, future stuff. Main beef with my project. Extremely complicated building that isn't really givable to you guys. So. If one of you wants to sit with me and help me figure out how to make make work and all right on a completely bare bones system, I would really be help into that because it's a big pain to make it work. Improved Ruby objects that can do more stuff. Most of the infrastructure is already there, but I've got stuff I haven't implemented yet, like those string annotations that people mentioned before. Also, input devices work great. Output devices don't quite work yet, but there's no reason why they shouldn't. I just haven't implemented that side of things. More testing, way more testing would be great. Okay, and then the final thing I want to mention is, so if you're feeling like, oh man, make files, uh, that doesn't sound that cool at all. Um, and you still want to have your Unix system use USB devices. I have another library called evdeb for Ruby. It uses the Linux evdeb framework, which is basically the Linux level device layer. Like, your kernel converts your USB devices into evdev devices, which is how normally Linux things access. But it's only for Linux, not OSX or BSD or anything like that. But the nice thing is because it's this kernel supported layer, it's really rock solid and never breaks or times out or does anything bad. So anyways, just an op thing. If you still want to do cool stuff, don't have time for any of this crap, we're just considering. Okay, so that's it. Questions? Okay. How does Ruby threads interoperate with, with this stuff? Um, I haven't tried it with multi-threaded programs. Um, I don't, I mean, I didn't go through a heck of a lot of trouble to make sure it was thread safe. 
Now, the one thing I can say is that when you're listening for interrupts, it actually spawns its own thread because the way libUSB works for some reason, when you, if you're not exactly listening for a USB event when an event comes in, it disappears. There's absolutely no buffering at all, which is a big problem because, you know, well, you can see why. So it actually spawns its own p-thread. So I bet that would probably be relatively safe because I actually do have a good bit of semaphores in that particular section. But as for the rest of it, I would bet you would probably see some, some bugs just because untested stuff doesn't work, right? What was your favorite hack for finding p-threads? Um, well, I have to say that this one I use every day, which is sort of cool. My, the funniest thing I did with it, and, I, and this was a totally dumb idea, but I did it, um, was I actually glued two keyboards together, and in VI, one was insert mode and one was not insert mode. <laughs> I was sort of curious if that would work. No. <laughs> oh, it did work. I mean, it, it did what it was supposed to. It basically, at least for the time I used it, it had exactly the same problem where you always were, instead of being always in the wrong mode, you were always typing on the wrong keyboard. <laughs> and it was just a lot of keyboard to have on your lap. But no, it's perfectly doable. If you want to try it, you can go for it pretty easy. Well, I mean, so I'd say um, the main thing I'd like to do is just refine this a little bit so that when I, when I want to plug stuff in, I mean, probably next on my list of things I'm just going to implement myself is just get another keyboard, not glued to the original keyboard, and just have 102 keys of, like, run this command, run this command, run this command. You know, not bad for $4. I, I mean, yeah, you could, I could probably get by with four, but... It's actually cheaper to get the keyboard than like any of the funky other devices you can get that will do that for you. Um, I mean, there's always. I mean, I'd say if I was going to go to something really cool, the building of USC devices is particularly slick. And then when you can hook it up to Ruby, it's like, okay, now I can program this thing and get it to do whatever I want. No, I, I have not, although that would be really awesome. I, I, I'm actually not particularly musically inclined myself, and so I haven't, but there are things where you can, there's plenty of projects where you can actually get USB musical instruments. So once you have that, the U, Ruby stuff is there. I mean, not really, but I can tell you that it's, it's I mean, I can type on the keyboard, and it's like, yep, 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 yep. So, I mean, um, I don't have any problem there, but there could be a problem with latency. Can't be sure, although I can tell you that because of the way I've buffered the input, you're not going to lose any information. So the only possibility is that the system would just be so slow that it would, that it would just sort of back up, which seems like sort of a, a long shot to me unless you're doing something really interesting. Like, it'd just be hard to imagine how that could really happen over a long period of time. But I would say test it would probably be the best idea. All right, thanks very much.